Welcome back to the Get Off the Treadmill podcast for practice owners and leaders where we are obsessed with how to build a successful practice and get a life too. Hi, I'm Chuck Blakeman and we're going to dive into another topic that helps us make more money in less time, get off the treadmill and rehumanize dentistry by giving everybody their brain back. Two-step decision-making is one of the 12 tools of a participation age practice. For more information on these 12 tools, you can email us at grow at cranksetgroup.com or better yet, directly to Krista, K-R-I-S-T-A, at cranksetgroup.com. She gets them both. We'll also have podcasts on all 12, so subscribe and listen. We rehumanize the workplace by giving everybody their brain back, and the principal way in which we do this is universally distributed decision-making through universally distributed leadership. Everybody becomes a leader. The reason for this is that the more input I have in a decision, the more ownership I will take in carrying it out. Input equals ownership. Therefore, decisions should be made locally whenever possible, and it's almost always possible. That said, if everyone and anyone can make decisions, that could be a recipe for chaos and anarchy. Two-step decision-making not only alleviates the chaos and anarchy concern, but is more orderly, more likely to create great communications between everyone impacted and much safer than management-focused decision-making. It always involves more than one person, and the bigger the decision, the more two-step decision-making ensures the right people will be involved. I like what Jack Dorsey says on this subject. He says, when I am making decisions, I am not leading. We believe that, that we've got a podcast on the difference between management and leadership, and that's a big piece of this. Managers tell Leaders ask. Managers make decisions. Leaders train other people to make decisions and they get out of the way. Distributed decision making is all about that and the two-step decision making process is the core of it. The core practice of the participation age is distributed decision making. Decision making and problem solving are not just important but they are central to what makes us human. Reintroduce decision making and the humanity flows back into people who once saw themselves as extensions of machines. And as a reminder, localized decision-making is both allowed and required in a participation age practice. We prefer people to want to make decisions because they are allowed. That is the response of a natural stakeholder, which might be 20 to 30% of the people in our practice. They rejoice in finally being recognized for their humanity and being allowed to make decisions. But a small majority, 50% or so, will have to relearn what it means to make decisions because they've been taught for 150 plus years to be codependent reactionaries to the commands of a manager. From the Roman Empire through the early 1800s, very few people remained employed. The overwhelming majority of free people throughout the history of the world owned their own business like farms, shops, stores. Almost no one worked for someone else in their entire life, even in societies without slaves, serfs, or other oppressive work arrangements. The point of that is that ownership of our work and the corresponding desire and need to make decisions is in our DNA. In the 1700s, many people spent years learning as an apprentice how to make an entire shoe, market it, sell it, and how to run the business of shoemaking. Then they ran their own shops for decades after that. Decision making was a way of life at work, not just at home. But in the late 1800s, we were taken out of the shoe shop and put on an assembly line where we followed commands, put a nail in the left boot, and passed it to the next guy beside us. In that one way, the Industrial Revolution and the corresponding Industrial Age of management and hierarchy were tectonic shifts in the fabric of what it meant for the average person to go to work, or really to work. They didn't even go to work before that. They worked from home. We no longer worked to make meaning in the factories, but simply to make money so we could go make meaning somewhere else in our lives. Work became an interruption in our lives, not something integrated into our lives. That's a really important distinction. The participation age wants to reintegrate work into our lives. Since then, we've thought it's normal to wait around for someone else to tell us what to do. So it will feel new to those who grew up in a system that has only dominated work for a very short period in history. We'll have to be patient because they have lost their ability to make decisions at work. So patience is necessary, but so is decision making. It is allowed and it is also required and it's something that is not optional. Patience does not mean capitulation. We need to see regular, consistent, measurable movement toward full adulthood at work, which means making decisions. The growing desire and ability to make decisions will show us that progress. We found that if we are patient, sometimes three months, six months, sometimes more, almost everyone will either jump on the bandwagon or will eventually climb on. Then there are the non-adopters. 
The other piece of the reality is that throughout history, there have always been a small minority of people who never wanted to own their own shop, run their own business, make decisions, or essentially grow into adulthood at home or at work. They've always been there. It's around 20%. And that's still the population of people that are considered completely disengaged at work. A few will eventually quit or we will need to move them along, but we have never seen this to be disruptive. To the contrary, when they are replaced, the right hiring process vets for stakeholders, not employees, and things can improve dramatically very quickly. We'll talk about that more in a podcast on reverse hiring. There's two simple steps to this process of decision-making. With the foundation that making decisions is allowed and required for everyone, how do we do it safely in an environment where managers don't exist, only leaders, who aren't going to tell us what to do. We want you to turn your office manager into an office leader, a very different concept. Here are the founding principles of the two steps for decision making. Number one, the more input I have in a decision, the more I will take ownership of that decision. Input equals ownership. You're gonna hear that a lot. Therefore, decisions should be made locally where they must be carried out whenever possible. And again, it's almost always possible. So two-step decision making is really this simple. Step one, decisions are made where they are carried out. The question is, who will carry this out? Those are the people who should make the decision. And step two, whoever is affected or impacted by the decision should always be consulted, and they should be part of that decision-making process. So who will be affected? It's utterly that simple. Who will carry this out and who will be affected? But we have found that in in a lot of companies steeped in factory system hierarchy, which still exists in most practices, it takes a few months for people to actually work it out in daily life. Step one rehumanizes through localized decision making and localized ownership of the decisions people have to carry out. Input equals ownership, and that ownership creates adulthood. Step two, who will be affected, ensures that chaos and anarchy are never present in the decision making and that everyone and anyone who wants input into that decision will have the opportunity to do so. It is step two that makes two-step decision making safe. It's also step two that people inadvertently miss quite often, thinking that somehow they covered it in step one by gathering some people to make a decision. Bill Gore built a company around two-step decision-making. He didn't call it that. But from 1958 on through until today, W.L. Gore, the makers of Gore-Tex, have a company that has 10,000 people in it with not a single manager in the whole place. No one person can hire. No one person can fire. It's networks of teams released to take action as stakeholders and as adults. Bill Gore had this concept of above and below the waterline decision-making. As the co-inventor of Gore-Tex and the founder of W.L. Gore, he had an elegant picture of step two that he used to help guide decision-making at Gore. If a few people appeared to be making decisions, it might result in shooting a hole above the waterline in the Gore business boat. He said we shouldn't stop them and we shouldn't chastise them afterwards. This is a learning process. They have to learn. Obviously, they're going to have to patch the hole, and in the process, they're likely to never make the same mistake again. But if they appear to be lining up a shot that could be below the waterline and take out the company itself, a lot more people need to get involved in order to make sure they don't sink that part of the company. The simple principle is that the bigger and more impactful the decision, the more people should be involved in that decision. Let's talk about the two-step process in practice. In hockey, soccer, lacrosse, games like that, whoever gets to the ball or the puck first is the leader for the moment. They need to make decisions about how to handle the ball or the puck and where to pass it next. Everything rests on their decision making. No one would play for a coach that gave everyone earpieces and told them exactly what to do throughout the game. But that's exactly how we expect people to respond to a manager who will sit there and tell them exactly what to do so they can simply execute the orders. It's dehumanizing. In two-step decision-making, we do it like a soccer game or a hockey game. We relocalize decisions and bring the humanity back into everyone's position. Everybody can grab the ball and has the responsibility to. It's allowed and it's required. And they decide how to move the ball forward with their team. This willingness to take initiative and grab things you would have traditionally left for the boss is central to two-step decision-making. Just like in soccer, there are no conditions under which we can look at a ball loose on the field and say, well, that's, that's not my job to kick the ball. That should be kicked by somebody else. Somebody should do something about that. Maybe the manager. Nope. Kick the ball and figure out later who should have kicked it if it's not you. This is the concept of leader-leader in action, which we talk about in another podcast at length. 
There are no peer followers in a participation age practice. Everyone leads and at some point everyone follows. There are just people everywhere in the business making sure there are no loose balls on the field. Grab the ball. So to play out that analogy, let's suppose Jenna makes copies and she perceives that the copier is on its last legs and might need to be replaced very soon. Jenna has done something people have done at work since the factory system got roaring in the 1800s. She has recognized a situation or a problem, or an opportunity. The people on the ground in the trenches are almost always the first ones to notice this stuff. But in true Dilbert cartoon fashion, they've been taught to wait around until the manager sees the problem. Then they praise the manager for being in front of the issue. Two-step decision-making diverges immediately at the outset. Instead of Jenna thinking, it's not my job, or somebody should do something about that, If she is the first one to recognize the issue, she is now the leader, at least early on. She must grab the ball by asking a step one question. So step one, who else makes copies? Who else will have to carry out the decision after it is made? Jenna makes a short list in her head of the three other people who, besides her, make 90% of the copies, and she goes and talks to them. Jenna is now forming a team of leaders who will address this situation. No manager needs to be inserted into this process. Nobody will need one to actually make the decision. So the next step is to form the team. Jenna communicates with those three other people and asks them if they think the copier is on its last legs. If everybody agrees, they set up a short 15 to 20 minute meeting to discuss next steps. What do we do about this? In the process, Jenna may ask someone else to lead the initiative going forward, or the four of them split up leadership responsibilities. I'll run the meeting, you research new copiers, you you be our two-step presenter, you do the reporting. Jenna could keep some of the leadership around organizing and push the same issue forward and distribute the other leadership needs like research, doing the numbers justification, presenting the issue to other teams or leaders, etc. The point of this is leadership is fluid. We don't have people who are elected and they just keep their office because they happen to have the epaulets on their shoulders. Leadership is fluid and we get people doing the right things because they're good at it. So the team meets, sometimes at the water cooler, sometimes in a conference room, depending on the need and the impact of the decision, the first question they should always ask in those meetings is the step two question. Who else will be affected or impacted by this decision? Who doesn't make copies, but will still be affected or impacted by this decision to buy a copier? We need to figure that out. There are at least three possible constituencies that need to be brought into such a process by asking the step two question. Whoever holds the purse strings, that's important. Accounting, the founder, whoever that is. The customers of the copies being made, that may be internal, it might be external. The IT function I can think of to ensure systems integration. There might be others that might need to be involved who are impacted. They'll never make a single copy, but they sure are impacted by the decision. The team could miss some of this or not be exactly sure who is affected, but an easy fix again is to use Slack or other simple communications tools to touch everyone in the office once and let them know they have X hours or days to respond, or the team will assume they aren't interested. People who are affected might ask to be part of the full decision-making process or might just have something they want you to consider and then they're out. But don't let the decision-making team get bigger than the decision. It's an intuitive process. Small decisions should have small teams and big decisions should usually have bigger teams. You might also have a professional meeting goer who wants to join everything. If they aren't truly and measurably impacted, ask that they give their input to someone on the team to communicate to the rest of the team and politely ask them to not come to the meetings. All right, things to settle in your first meeting. Number one, who's the leader? It might be the person who grabbed the ball, the person who recognized the problem at first. They might not feel like they want to or are equipped to lead this initiative. And they might suggest, why don't we have Bob lead that? And everybody decides that. Or someone might just suggest to them, hey, are you really the person to lead this? It could be two or three people. Leadership is not a position, it's a function. And sometimes it takes two or three or four people to lead. Let's stop looking for the guy in the white horse. Secondly, let's figure out when the leader, or at least the facilitator of the meeting, is elected. They should set a meeting length. How long should we talk? 15 minutes? Two days? How long do we think we should talk? Let's set a time for this. We should also set a timeline for making the decision. How many days... How many months should we take to make this decision? Let's have it done by this date at noon. Set a date. Next, how will we decide? Majority, 80% rule. Do we need a mediator to do this or a arbitrator to do this for us? Is it too sensitive? Let's figure out how we're going to decide before there's a dog in the hunt. 
And then lastly, again, do we need a mediator? Is this a touchy subject? Invite someone with good mediating skills to lead the discussions and maybe even have the final say as an arbitrator. If there's emotions or complications that you feel like would require that, don't be afraid to get a mediator involved in the meeting. Again, it depends on the size of the decision. Small decisions should not take a lot of energy. Bigger decisions, you don't want to shoot a hole below the waterline. This is important. As we go through this process, we as practice leaders have to understand there are no mistakes. There are only seminars. One of the reasons, among many, that people don't want to make decisions at work is because they know that they're going to get yelled at. People who are relearning to make decisions must be encouraged to take small risks. We have to celebrate decision making, even if the outcome isn't always what we desire. If people feel no freedom to experiment and learn and the specter of failure looms over them, they're going to have no interest in relearning how to make decisions. My friend Alan Weingarten taught me to substitute the notion of mistakes with the concept of seminars. There are no mistakes, there are only seminars. Some seminars are longer than others, some are more expensive than others, but they're just seminars. So we encourage people not to make mistakes, but to have seminars. And we have two rules around seminars. Number one, Keep the seminar as short and inexpensive as possible. Time and money are at a premium. Don't go to really long, really expensive seminars if they're not going to be valuable. And then secondly, don't repeat seminars you already took. If we are taking the same seminar repeatedly, it's no longer a mistake. It's a pattern of not learning. And you'll hear another podcast on the difference between mistakes versus patterns and how we have to deal with those very differently. So let's role play this stuff. It's good to take a look back at recently made decisions and role play how to two-step them or maybe how the process went down. Or you can take a live opportunity to role play two-step decision making. This would be a great thing for your practice to do. It could be that your practice is nailing this naturally, but likely there is some fine-tuning or fairly significant changes you're going to have to make. Remember the objective and always look for a good decision, not a perfect one. So let's role play a decision or pick a new one. First, pick a leader, and it could be multiple leaders depending on the size of the decision. You could have a facilitator who's good at facilitating, somebody else is good at something else. Functional leadership. Pick a leader and use the protocol that we talked about earlier to start the discussion and practice timekeeping and voting. How long should it take? Rules for making a decision? Do we need a mediator? And how will we ensure everyone who's impacted has their input? Do we use Slack.com or some other email or some other way to get this out there? Who and how many will do the research if there is a need for that? When do we meet again to resolve this? And we should already have a date for when it's going to be resolved. Do we all agree that once the decision is made, we will all get on board? That's a real important thing to get done right up front. This is not about consensus. This is about everybody getting their input. But once we've made a decision, whether it's 60% or a mediator, we all jump on board. It's important that we all agree once a decision is made. It is treated by everyone as if the decision was the one they wanted. We're not shooting for nirvana here, just great input, a highly collaborative process, and that the decision be made locally by those who will have to carry it out. If we've done those things, we're on the road to rehumanizing the workplace by giving everybody their brain back. All right, I want to close this by talking a little bit directly to strategic leaders, to the people who own the practice or lead the practice. There are five steps strategic leaders can take in the decision-making process in actually facilitating a two-step decision-making process. Step number one, a stakeholder or a tactical leader, somebody else brings something to you and what they should bring to you is not, hey, we got a problem or, hey, we need you to to come up with a solution. They need to come to you having gone through the two-step process decided what they want to do, and basically come to be transparent and communicate so that everybody who is impacted gets a say. So they come to you and they say something like, I intend to do X. If you haven't read the book by David Marquette, Turn the Ship Around, it's a great little book about how he turned a submarine around with this idea of having people come to him instead of with problems, they come with solutions. I intend to do X. That's step number one. Step number two, the strategic leader is going to ask, who else could answer this for you? And really, they should have asked this themselves. But if you think there's somebody else who could actually vet this decision and they're coming to you, then you need to say, what about Sally? Do you think she could help you vet this decision before you make it? I have confidence in Sally. Do you have confidence in Sally? Distributed decision making. We train people to come to us 
We train them to be codependent on us, and then we're dis tired and discouraged because there's this line outside our door waiting for an audience with the Pope to be told what to do. Let's find other people. Let's always be thinking, is there somebody else that they could have gone to for this decision? Step number three, ask them, have you done all the homework? We don't want codependents here. We're not asking them to come to us so that we can do the homework. They should do it, and we should simply be vetting their homework. We'll do our own homework, but they should do theirs as well. We have a clever little way of talking about this in our company. When someone comes to someone else and says, I intend to do X, we say something snarky like, have you Googled that? And what we mean by that is there are so many opportunities out there for you to get information on this to figure out how to make this decision. Have you availed yourself of all the opportunities from Google to spreadsheets to your teammates to data in the practice? Have you done everything you can to research this on your own? I'm not your mommy. I'm not going to do that for you. You should have come having already done that, which is why you can say, I intend to do X. Step four, the leader asks questions. If they've done all their homework, then start asking the questions you have from your own homework. Have you thought about how this impacts the other teams? What do you think about this relative to the bottom line? Do you think this will add profit or take profit away? Is this going to be easier or harder? Have you thought about the impact on so-and-so? As strategic leaders, we add great value by helping people take their decisions, which are made in a localized environment, and we help them see how they impact the whole thing. So asking questions until we feel like we've got this figured out. Managers tell, leaders ask, ask questions. Once you guys have figured out together that there's no holes in what they have figured out, then it's really sort of a uh, Star Trek Captain Picard kind of thing where you just say, make it so. Do what you intended. So that's the five steps. I intend to do X. Who else could answer this instead of me? Have they done all their homework? Ask all the questions you can to make sure it's a good decision and then confirm it to them and congratulate them for having come up with something great and have them do what they intended. Remember, the art of leadership is to know how few decisions the leader needs to make. So as a strategic leader, make a list of the things that you decide that others could decide. Choose one of the things on that list and match it to a person and then begin to train that person. Or if it's a piece of software, whatever you have to do to get this thing off your plate, take one of these at a time, distribute the decision-making and encourage people to get involved in two-step decision-making. And then repeat this with the intention of making fewer and fewer decisions for other people by training them to make better decisions than you would. Remember, the art of leadership is to know how few decisions the leader needs to make. And then devise a prize or regular prizes to celebrate people who have completed a seminar something we used to call a mistake. Let's celebrate them and share that award regularly at team meetings to show who has courage. Make it the Courage Award or something like that. The Courage to Actually Grow or the Learner's Award or something like that to encourage people to push ahead. Have the winners share with others what they learned at the seminar and why they won't likely need to take that seminar again. That's a great way for them to embed the learning. If we don't encourage experimenting and learning through trial and seminars, People will not take us seriously about distributing decision-making. It's not trial and error, it's trial and seminars. If you'd like a one-sheeter guide to two-step decision-making, we've got one of those we'd be glad to give you. Email Krista at cranksetgroup.com, K-R-I-S-T-A, or grow at cranksetgroup.com, and she'll be glad to send you the one-sheeter guide that anyone can use to work through an issue and follow this simple two-step decision-making process. Our driving passion to rehumanize dentistry into the participation age by giving everybody their brain back. And remember the central practice to accomplish this is two-step decision making. Let's help people learn how to be full-on stakeholder adults who will be able to take the initiative to get involved in making decisions that they have to carry out. Grab the ball and run with it. Give everybody their brain back, allow and require localized decision making, and you'll achieve 100% engagement. If this podcast was helpful, please subscribe by computer or by phone or connect with us at www.gotsummit.com, two T's, G-O-T-T -T, summit.com. That stands for Get Off the Treadmill. We have those summits quarterly for dental practitioners only. Or connect with us at www.chuckblakeman.com or email us at grow at cranksetgroup.com. Let's get off that treadmill. Let's get into the participation age. I look forward to seeing you in the next podcast. Thanks. Thanks.